Hi there, this is Maria, the founder of Four Season Foraging, a Minneapolis-based business that teaches you to safely and sustainably identify and harvest wild edibles. I'm in Minneapolis today. It is incredibly smoky. I don't know if you can tell from this video, if you can see all the haze and stuff, but the smoke from the wildfires in Canada it has just been blowing down straight into Minnesota and the air quality here has been really bad um, today. Like if I smell the air, it even just smells like smoke. It smells like there's, you know, a campfire. So yeah, pretty intense, but on the bright side, at least it's not a hundred degrees anymore. So I guess there's something to be thankful for. Anyway, extreme weather aside, Today I am here to teach you about wild bergamot and this is a native wildflower that can be used as an herb for both culinary and medicinal purposes. And it's super great, one of my favorite herbs and plants in general, so I'm excited to show it to you all. I hope that you like learning about it. If you do like the video, please hit the like button subscribe to my channel and ring the bell for notifications. It helps me out a lot. And if you have a couple extra dollars a month, you can join me on Patreon. The link is down below in the description box. And on there, you can pledge a small monthly dollar amount to help me keep making these free informative videos for you all. Thanks a lot. So what is wild bergamot? Well, it's this plant growing next to me here with the light purple slash lavender flowers. This is also more bergamot behind me here. It just, uh, the flowers are done, so they're not as conspicuous as these ones here. But all around me, there's several bergamot plants, wild bergamot plants growing. And wild bergamot, the Latin name is Monarda fistulosa. Now there is another plant that's really similar that's called, usually called bee balm, and that Latin name is Monarda didiama. And the two are used interchangeably. You can substitute one for the other. The difference in appearance is that bee balm is a much larger plant. It's much taller and the leaves are larger and the flower head is larger and the flowers, instead of this lavender pale purple color, they're like a bright scarlet. I just want to bring that up because those two plants do often get confused. People often use the common names interchangeably. So wild bergamot is often called bee balm, often called monarda, which the other plant, monarda didiama, is also often called monarda. So just heads up, there might be a little confusion there. But again, it's not a big deal if you do happen to confuse the two because they are very similar. Also, FYI, another common confusion. This is not the bergamot that's used to flavor Earl Grey. That is, uh, it's actually a tree. It's a citrus tree. And it's not closely related to wild bergamot at all. <laughs> so actually, I don't know where the name for this comes from because it doesn't look or taste like bergamot. But yeah, you'll read in a lot of places that this is what's used to flavor Earl Grey. And I used to believe that and I used to tell people that. And at some point I realized that was incorrect. <laughs> um, I can't remember if I read it somewhere, if I just figured it out, like after tasting this a million times, I was like, you know, this doesn't taste like Earl Grey at all. This can't be the same plant. And then, you know, I did more research and realized I was correct. Because yeah, if you smell this, like even, <sighs> being close to it here I can smell the aroma coming off and it's very similar to oregano it's kind of like a spicy Italian herb so it's not at all like that lemony flavor that you get in Earl Grey that comes from the bergamot tree so common misconception just want to point it out just in case you come across it so where can you find wild bergamot well places like this is really typical fields prairies open woods, trail sides. It's also a pretty popular cultivated plant, so you can 
see it fairly frequently growing in people's yards or in front of businesses or planted in boulevards or places like that. And it is quite widespread. It grows across most of North America and it is a native plant. And I would say it's fairly common, like it's pretty easy to find and usually when you find it, it grows in large stands. So even though this is a native wildflower, I usually feel good about picking it because it's usually widely distributed and it's pretty hard to disturb. It's a perennial and it's in the mint family. So if you've ever planted mints before, you probably know how hardy those are and how hard they are to kill. So as long as the plants are looking healthy and there's a healthy population, I feel pretty good about harvesting them. So how do I know that this plant is in the mint family? Well, like all mints, it has a square stem. So you can kind of see the squareness of the stem. If you look further down on the stem where it's thicker, you can see the ridges. You can also kind of roll it between your fingers and feel those ridges. Or you could cut off just like the very top part and look at the cross section and you'll see that it's square. I think that's kind of the hardest way to tell though, honestly, because when you cut it, it can kind of deform the shape and it can be hard to see the square shape, especially when the stem is like so small at the top. But it does have a square stem and also like all other mints, it has opposite leaves. So the leaves grow off directly opposite each other on the stem versus alternate leaves, which are spaced apart on the stem so they stagger. Mints are also often aromatic. Not always, but they are often. And this one is definitely aromatic. And like I said earlier, it smells a lot like oregano. So if you get pretty close to it, you don't even necessarily have to uh, pick it, but if it's fresh, you should be able to smell that aroma coming off. And then the final thing that distinguishes mints is the flowers. So they're irregular flowers often tube shaped and by irregular i just mean they're not radially symmetrical so like how a sunflower or a daisy you can divide it at any angle as long as it goes through the middle it'll be symmetrical but with these they're just bilaterally symmetrical so you can divide it one way straight through the middle like up and down and it'll be symmetrical that way when you're looking straight at it but otherwise it's not the flowers are often tubular. These are very tubular, <laughs> growing in these like narrow long tubes. And the mint family has, the flowers have two lips. So there is an upper part and a lower part to the flower. Each plant here has a lot of flowers on it. Like each of these little individual purple guys is a flower. Like you might kind of think of it like a petal, but it's just a cluster of smallish flowers. And so the way I know it's wild bergamot in particular is by the pale purple color of the flowers. And also the smell is quite distinctive. Once you learn the smell, you should be able to identify it even without the flowers. You should be able to see it and know just by the smell that it's wild bergamot. And yeah, once you work with it a lot and get to know it really well, you'll just like recognize the leaf shape. Like I just said earlier, it has opposite leaves and they have like somewhat coarse toothing and then a pointed tip. So what do you do with wild bergamot? Well, it is a delicious herb and you can use it culinarily or medicinally. And when using it culinarily, you usually just want the leaves. So you can just pick off some of the leaves off of each plant. Usually around this time of year, they're like at the height of flowering, but this year has been pretty weird with the extreme heat and the drought. So these are a little bit past their prime. I would actually get them earlier than this. Like the leaves are kind of spotty and kind of yellowing. So not ideal right now, <laughs> but you can find some, like there's some growing around here that aren't flowering and those leaves still look quite fresh and young. 
So what you can do is just like pick off a few leaves from the stem, you know, leave enough leaves for the plant to continue living. Don't pick off all the leaves. Definitely less than half, I would say, probably around a quarter to be safe. And if you do happen to find it where it's not flowering yet, you can do like what you do with basil or with other mints. Basil is also in the mint family, where you pick off the top of it. Like if this was all parts that I wanted to eat, which right now it's not really because it's not looking too hot, but you would just pick off the top. You can use a little scissor or just use your fingers to pinch it and put that in your little bag and take it home. And what will happen is it will split at that point. And if you have, you know, mint at home or basil or oregano, then you'll be familiar with this. It'll just, the stem will split and it'll keep growing. So you're actually not hurting the plant by harvesting it like that. You're actually encouraging it to become bigger and more bushy. The one thing you don't want to do when harvesting this is digging up the whole plant and taking it home. That is not sustainable bad manners, just don't do it. Leave it out here to grow in the wild with its friends and you can just, you know, take a little bit and go home with it and be happy to know that it will always be out here for you. You don't need to kidnap it. But anyhow, what you actually want to do with it, so you take those leaves, you can use them fresh or you can dry them and basically use them how you would use oregano so you can chop them up put them in a salad use them in pasta pizza basically anywhere where you would like a spicy italian like herb it's going to be delicious in as far as medicinally what i like to do is harvest the flowering stems so again these are a little past their prime this year i would prefer to get them earlier but what I would do is just like snip off the flower and the first maybe two or three rows of leaves. And again, don't take too much from one plant. Make sure that you're distributing among the plants and leaving enough leaves for the plant to continue growing. And again, the stem will just split and keep growing. So it will just encourage it to become more bushy and produce more flowers and you won't actually hurt it as long as you don't take too much. So medicinally, wild bergamot has a lot of different uses. It's antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. It also is a digestive aid and it's a uterine stimulant. So for that reason, actually, if you're pregnant, especially in the early weeks of pregnancy, you should avoid it. And definitely talk to your doctor or midwife or whoever you have to check if it's safe because it does have what's called an amenagogue action where it kind of encourages blood flow. But for that reason, it is great for painful menstruation. It'll help ease that. And as far as the antibacterial qualities, it is great to use against colds and flus. It helps with sore throats. You can drink it hot or use it as a gargle. It's also really great for toning the gums and for gum infections like gingivitis. You can make a tea out of it and swish it around in your mouth or you can make a tincture and use that and swish it in your mouth. And the bitter qualities, is mainly what makes a good digestive aid. Also some of the aromatic principles help relieve gas. And yeah, it's great to take usually before a heavy meal to kind of help stimulate the digestion. Or if you're just having irregular digestion, it'll kind of help balance that out. It's also astringent, which basically means that it helps tone tissue, like it helps pull tissue together. So that makes it really great for toning the gums and also for sore throats. The antibacterial qualities can also help with urinary tract infections. And usually what you want to do for that is make a tea and drink it cold and it'll help flush the bacteria out of your system. And as far as its antifungal properties, it can be used both internally and externally to help cure those. Again, you can drink a tea or a tincture 
And if you have a fungal infection on your skin, you can just pour the tea over that. Or if you have a yeast infection, you can use the tea made from it as a douche to help clear that out. And you can find more information as far as like dosages and the best ways to prepare a tea and a tincture online. There's lots of resources out there and I'll link a couple in the description box down below. But yeah, it's a great plant to have on hand in your medicine cabinet. And I especially like to have it during the winter to help with things like coughs and colds and sore throats and the flu. So a really great plant ally to have on your side. So that's the end of my video about wild bergamot. I hope that you learned a few things and feel inspired to go out there and try some for yourself. If you did, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. It helps me out a lot for free. But if you do happen to have a few extra dollars a month, you can join me on Patreon. The link is right down there in the description box. And on there, you can pledge a small monthly dollar amount to help me keep making these free informative videos that you enjoy. So if you could do that, it would be super awesome. I would love you forever. <laughs> but if you can't do it, that's okay too. Either way, happy foraging. Mm -hmm.